everyone. So this is really exciting for us because it's really the first time we're doing a debate style uh, session. So, uh, so I, let's just get on with it. So uh, welcome to the Bitcoin debate. And I guess, so our topic for today is, is Bitcoin the future of currency? And as you know, Bitcoin has ignited fierce debate and on one hand is hailed as the disruptor of finance, governments, legal systems and more. So yet on the other hand, critics warn that Bitcoin is nothing more than a fad that will never gain mass adoption. So today, uh, the debate is it's not really a cat fight, right? It's more of about helping us to gain a deeper understanding of the topic. So here's the format. Uh, on um, each speaker, right, starting with Aurelian, uh, the, the founder of Gatecoin, uh, will we'll give a two minute opening statement about his position and whether he thinks Bitcoin is the future of currency. So on the op op opposing side, uh, Richard Jerem uh, will of course argue the opposite position. Following that, we will ask each speaker a series of questions and they have two minutes each to answer each one. They would then be allowed one minute to rebut uh, one another. At the end, each speaker will have a minute to make their closing statements. So the winner will be decided entirely by you, the audience, and we'll have more details on that later. Yeah. Uh, so the victor will, will be announced near the end of the conference. So if you guys are ready, I think it's only, yeah. So if you guys are ready, okay. Yeah, Aurelian, you have two minutes to make your opening statement starting now. Hi, everyone. Uh, so obviously, uh, yes, I think that Bitcoin is the future of currencies. Um, I think the best way to understand Bitcoin is to uh, think about what about like 10 years ago uh, with uh, Amazon, eBay, uh, or Skype disrupting uh, the way we were buying, buying goods or the way we were communicating. And for me, Bitcoin is exactly the same. Uh, I mean, the best comparison would be to compare Bitcoins to Skype. Uh, we used to, um, whenever we wanted to call someone abroad, we used to use our phones and pay huge amounts to our uh, phone, telephone operators. And suddenly Skype arrived and disrupted the market, allowing us to go through the internet uh, network and just pay uh, a local uh, communication. And Skype, uh, sorry, uh, Bitcoin is exactly the same. Instead of uh, sending money abroad to the banking system that's going to charge you huge fees in terms of international transfer and spreads on the foreign exchange, um, you're just going to buy some bitcoins and send them instantly uh, to, your, uh, re to the receiver who's going to be able to exchange it in his own currency for a very, very small amount. Um, another point on, bit on bitcoin is the reliability of the system which is uh, actually somehow even more reliable than uh, some uh, currencies or some uh, financial operators or payment service processors that you can find online and that you can't know you can uh, rely on. Uh, as the Bitcoin uh, net, uh, system is totally decentralized, it's uh, not cheatable and it's 100% uh, reliable. Um, I think I'm done. Right. So, uh, Richard, you have two minutes. Starting now. Thanks. Uh, great, great pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm going to be putting forward the negative view. I, you know, I realize that's a bit like being a, in this conference, uh, you know, a vegetarian at a hot dog eating competition. But I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to convince you uh, about a negative future for, for, for bitcoins. Um, my view is basically the future of bitcoins is is similar to the uh, the future for for Betamax videos or, or Esperanto. Um, maybe you can put the first slide up. Now, it seems to me that there's a lot of things. Um, you know, flared trousers, invading Iraq, my first wife. There's, there's, there, there's a lot of things that seem like a good idea at the time, right? <laughs> um, um, and with the passage of time, we, we might come to, to regret them. I think this is the, the situation for, for Bitcoin. And I was thinking, rather than, you know, what is the future? I thought, actually, what is Bitcoin? It's a bit hard to define really what it is. Now, it seems to me that it's not an investment. You know, to have an investment, you need to have a cash flow. Uh, it has no cash flow, so the value should be zero. I mean, even 
even Twitter has a cash flow, right? So maybe the, the value is not, not zero. Uh, I think it's not a currency because it doesn't have any of the features of a currency in terms of being a, a store of value, a unit of exchange, this type of thing. And it seems to me uh, it's not a payment system in that I think there are, maybe we can discuss this, there are other cheaper, um, more convenient uh, payment systems around. So I thought, so, so, so what is it exactly? And it seems to me it's basically it's a novelty. Uh, and I can understand it's very clever. You know, it does appeal to libertarians, you know, drug dealers, um, technology nerds. Time's up, time's up. But, but aside from that, I think it's basically a Ponzi scheme. Okay. Oh, that's a good ending. Uh, okay. The first question related to what you said, is Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme? So Richard, this time you get to go first. Your two minutes start now. Yeah, it's Bitcoin a Ponzi scheme. I, I think it's a Ponzi scheme, um, and I'm very worried, uh, doing some research ahead of this, that I was reading that uh, the proportion of trade of Bitcoins uh, has recently fallen from, people using it as speculation, has fallen from 90% to 80%. So it seems most people are using it as, a, as an investment. Now, well, I'm not really a banker, I'm an economist, but I work for a bank. But when you're trying to value an asset, you always value an asset by the cash flow that asset is going to generate over time and you discount it back to the present day. So, you know, shares in a company, a bond, whatever, you can see it generates a, a flow of cash and you can work out a value. So Bitcoin can never generate any flow of cash at all. Right? It generates no uh, earnings power. And I think on that basis, uh, the value as an investment asset, which most people are using it for, must be zero. And if the value is zero and people are buying it for 200, they can think they can sell it for 300. It's really just a question of who's the guy holding the, the baby at the end of the day when everybody else decides it's, it's worth nothing. Uh, and that's why I think it's a Ponzi scheme. Okay, thank you. So, Aurelian, you have two minutes. So, um, first of all, I don't agree with you with your definition of uh, an investment because a lot of people invest in currencies, and uh, currencies are not related to cash flow. And um, what I would say is um, you have three stages of, uh, ad of uh, adoption of a currency. The first one is a speculative stage where people are just buying the currency uh, to invest in it. The second one is uh, the use of the currency as a mean of exchange. And the third one as a unit of account. And um, Bitcoin is obviously at a very early stage, and so far it's still at the speculative uh, stage where people are just buying it uh, because they think they're going to make more money uh, with it, which uh, I think can be true, but it's very risky. Um, but the, ver the very point of Bitcoin is to become uh, a unit of ex uh, a mean of exchange, and uh, the whole technology behind Bitcoin has been designed to uh, to allow people to instantly exchange. Uh, globally uh, assets and values. So uh, in that regard, I really don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. The Ponzi scheme is more a consequence of the very earliness of the technology and, um, and in itself by designs being totally open source and totally decentralized, it's not a Ponzi scheme. Uh, I mean, uh, if the value is increasing or decreasing, uh, the money is not going to, uh, to, the same, uh, to the same guy. When you have a Ponzi scheme, it's organized by someone who's centralizing the money from all the investors and uh, redistributing part of it to other people. It's not at all what's happening with Bitcoin. Uh, it's not the way a Bitcoin system is designed. So Richard, would you like to respond? Yeah, one minute. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in some ways this highlights the confusion about what is a, a Bitcoin. Um, I mean, currency investment, it generates a cash flow, right? Because you put your money in a bank in Australia, you get some interest income. So I think that is uh, an investment. Gold generates no cash flow. It's worthless on the basis of investment, but it does have some real world uses like, you know, filling your teeth or jewelry, whatever. Um, but I think th the point I would make is that most people are using this as an investment. And I think there's a question, you know, is, it a, is it a money, is it a unit of ex exchange, is it a payment system? Maybe it is, but that doesn't seem to be the way that most people in the world are, are approaching it um, as, in terms of the, the function. Aurelian? Uh, no, I agree, but I think it's just a matter of maturity and uh, just a matter of Bitcoin being very new for everyone. 
and, uh, and people are just looking at it so far, looking at the profits they could generate, like uh, it's a bit of a gamble. Uh, but um, and the thing is, so far we are also lacking some uh, some um, solutions with uh, uh, that are uh, user friendly enough to allow people to send money uh, very easily. So far, you you need to create an account on an exchange, uh, register, uh, send uh, send money to a, to a weird uh, Bitcoin address. We really lack something like a, a very good app, uh, exactly like Skype. I mean, uh, in Skype, if you had to type uh, the IP address of your uh, contact each time you want to contact him, no one would use Skype. And uh, so we need uh, an app in the same way that would. Uh, allow you to send uh, directly money to your contact, identifying it by his contact and so on, so you would even not know that you're using Bitcoin. Okay, so, so to summarize a little bit, so I think we just position is that Bitcoin right now, even though it's pur purported to be a currency, that isn't really, it isn't really used that way, but for Aurelion, it, it's about the future of Bitcoin and what potential it has uh, when it comes to the blockchain technology. So related to that, if Bitcoin is to have a future, government regulation will come in really heavily. So my question is, will government regulation kill Bitcoin? So this time, Aurelian, you have two minutes, starting now. I uh, don't think at all. I think actually it's uh, something that would uh, really support it, because it would, um, it would really uh, help people trusting it more. I mean... Um, I'm sure that a lot of people were interested in Bitcoin and uh, saw what happened to empty Gox and thought, oh no, it's too dangerous, uh, the counterparty risk is too important. Um, it's exactly what happened uh, at the beginning of uh, online shops on the internet. People were not buying because people were scared of their uh, uh, credit card numbers being stolen and so on. And, um, and regulation, I think, is very important. And uh, we are actually discussing it before, but uh, at Gitcoin, we're really in favor of a very clear regulation, even strong, but moderated regulation, a bit like what is happening uh, in Europe, especially in France or in Germany, or also in the US, in some states. Um, we really need a, a clear regulation, first to, uh, to prevent any, um, uh, any uh, money laundering or fraud uh, use of Bitcoin but also to protect uh, the customers and to set some um, requirements and standards for the exchanges um, to protect the customers and to, um, to improve their trust. And that's, I think, the way um, Bitcoin will become more and more popular. I mean, we really need uh, some trust to be created. Thank you. Jet? Yeah, I think, I think regulation has the potential to, 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 to kill uh, the use of bitcoins, and I think you should understand, governments uh, receive a great benefit from their ability to issue money, so paper money, or in the case of Singapore, plastic money. Uh, the increase in money in Singapore last year was about one and a half billion dollars. That's basically government taking plastic, giving it to you, and you think it has some value. And I don't think governments are going to give up that uh, seniorage right uh, very easily. So I think once bitcoin becomes, if it becomes ever large enough to be more than a novelty, then the governments will have an incentive to kill it, because otherwise they're going to have to raise, raise more taxes. Because the other thing that the government's been doing a lot of lately is uh, money laundering and taxation. And there's been a global squeeze to try to uh, clamp down on these areas. And I think, uh, again, they need to regulate uh, very clearly to make sure that you don't have an avenue uh, around to evade uh, the regulations on, on these sort of areas. So again, I think there's the risk uh, that uh, if it becomes large enough, there's going to be an incentive for, for governments to regulate to, to kill uh, the, the product. Uh, yeah, but I don't understand. Uh, sorry, I don't agree. Uh, and you, if you see uh, the statement of Bern ben Bernanke uh, in the US, uh, it clearly saw uh, the opportunity of Bitcoin was for the users, but also for the governments um, by creating uh, more, uh, more services, more values, and also more profits to tax. And um, more and more countries are debating at the moment on the way uh, they're going to tax Bitcoin, whether it's a commodity, it's an investment, or, um, or a, new, uh, a new product. Um, so... Uh, 
I've, it really depends. I mean, uh, China and the uh, U.S. have very different uh, stances on the, on the question. But most of countries uh, so far uh, really see Bitcoin as an opportunity they need to explore and to seize for, uh, for the future. So I, I really don't think uh, so, uh, they, uh, they have any interest in uh, killing it. And you can see also, like in Canada, Canada is creating the mint, its own uh, digital currency. Okay, time's so, up. Sorry. So, Richard, one minute. Uh, yes, as I said, I think you know, the main customers for, for Bitcoins are uh, you know, libertarians, um, drug smugglers, and, and tech nerds. And, and I think if you regulate, then you basically kill the demand from the first two of those uh, areas. So all you're really left with are, are tech nerds. Okay, so I mean, you know, take a look at the guy sitting next to you, figure out which of those three categories he, he falls into. But, you know, maybe just that I'm old, but my guess is there are maybe not enough tech nerds in the world uh, to make this uh, hit a critical mass, uh, to, to make it a viable, uh, viable concept and anything, anything more than just a novel, novelty. Thank you. So this question of whether Bitcoin will, will uh, reach mainstream, mainstream adoption, I think is the biggest question facing the future of Bitcoin. If it doesn't have value among the masses, if the barrier to entry is too high, then uh, Bitcoin will never take off. So my next question is related to, the, to that. So could Bitcoin one day we place a dollar. In other words, could a man on the street start to use back Bitcoin as much as he start to use the Singapore dollar or the US dollar? Okay, so Richard, this time uh, you're up. Two minutes, starting now. I mean, we're always interested in uh, disruptive technologies. As Orlean says, you know, there's been some fantastic uh, developments. Um, I think my concern about this is that it's not clear to me that it really is cheaper. I mean, my understanding is it's about 1% in, 1% out if you want to trade you know, from dollars into bitcoins into Singapore dollars. I can go to my bank and they can move my money for a fraction of that. Right? If it would cost you half, maybe 1% all in to shift your money from a bank in the US to a bank in Singapore. So I don't see basically how uh, there's a competitive edge uh, in, involved in this. Um, now, it may be that it'll get cheaper, but I think if it gets cheaper, all that happens, uh, history suggests, is that everything else gets cheaper as well. So, you know, you, f you use your uh, Singtel to make an international call or whatever, it's an awful lot cheaper than it was uh, 10, 20 years ago, and because of the emergence of these disruptive technologies. So, the winner is certainly the consumer, um, but I, I fail to see how it, it makes the existing standards uh, obsolete, um, because I, I just don't think it has enough of a, uh, a, cost, a cost advantage in return for the complexity that you have to participate in. Okay, thank you. Um, so first of all, the credit card fees uh, for, reseller, for online resellers are in between uh, 3 to 15 percent, depending on the industry they're in. Uh, while uh, Bitcoin uh, exchange fees are usually in between 0.1 to 0.6 percent. Um, I don't think Bitcoin will replace uh, dollar on a daily use. Um, once again, I'm going to refer to, to Skype because they are very similar. Skype didn't replace uh, phone calls. But for many, uh, for certain types of phone calls, it replaces, uh, it replaced them. And uh, Bitcoin would be the same. Um, I mean, um, whenever you want to send a small amount of money abroad, uh, the, char the bank fees are going to be more important than the amount you're sending. So, for instance, for this type of um, transfer, Bitcoin would be very interesting. Uh, at the moment, for instance, we're creating uh, Bitcoin charities, which will be a, a system to allow uh, small charities around the world to receive um, small donations from everywhere. And this is something that's not possible at the moment through the, the money system we have or through the, the bank system we have. Because if you want to send like uh, five or ten dollars to a small uh, association in Vietnam, you're going to pay like uh, 20 to 30 uh, uh, dollars of fees. So this is an example of a, of a use that where Bitcoin is very relevant compared to the existing uh, cur uh, money system. <coughs> Richard? Yeah, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm in favor of anything which reduces transaction costs, but it, but it seems to me there are easier ways to do this. I mean, I think in the States now we have Square, 
right? I mean, you've got PayPal, obviously, uh, which are very easy, very cheap ways of sending dollars to dollars. Um, and I think the other thing is, when you do pay a high fee for transactions, it's usually because of the complexity of the transaction. So, you know, Western Union, you, know, you would think has no reason to exist. They charge 10, 15% to send cash from here to somewhere else. But it's simply because there's no other way of achieving it uh, that they charge so much. You know, of course, you welcome anything that brings down the price. Um, but it seems to me there should be an easy way to bring down the price rather than inventing, you know, some fantasy currency and switching into it and then switching out of it again. I thought simply finding a cheaper way to send dollars around the world ultimately is going to be a, a better solution to the problem. One minute. Uh, I do think Bitcoin is that solution. With Bitcoin ATMs, you actually um, you're actually allowing people uh, in countries with very low banking penetration, like Philippines or uh, even Indonesia, um, to uh, to be able to receive cash from uh, everywhere uh, instantly and very easily. Um, so uh, I think uh, once again, Bitcoin is uh, it's one of the examples of uh, where Bitcoin can be uh, relevant. Uh. Okay. okay, so we've always talked about Bitcoin as a currency, right? So the fact that you can send money from one country to another with near zero transaction fees, that is one attraction of Bitcoin. But there's a whole debate about what Bitcoin can be outside of being a currency uh, with the underlying blockchain technology which allows a, a very uh, peer uh, crowdsourced way to verify transactions. So my, I guess my fourth question, the last question would be, does, big, does blockchain technology or the technology underlying Bitcoin have interesting have uh, potential uh, applications outside of currency that could gain mass adoption? So this time Aurelian, you get to start. Okay, two minutes. Yeah, actually, actually yeah, Bitcoin is, uh, before being a currency, it's a new technology and a new way of verifying a transaction or an agreement. And um, it's so far very undeveloped, but there, there are, there's a very big potential for uh, applications like um, for contracts, signatures, uh, agreements, and so on, uh, to be able to um, to set uh, rules to have uh, several con uh, counterparties signing the the agreement for it for it to be uh, to be validated, and with uh, a reliability that you wouldn't have with uh, actually the, the system we use actu uh, currently with the signatures that are very uh, easily um, uh, that you can uh, really uh, counterfeit very easily. Uh, the system would be actually way safer. But um, it's still uh, an even more early stage. Um, but some companies are already working on it, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised. Like within a ten year, ten or even maybe five years, lots of companies will uh, sign, uh, start signing more and more their uh, their emails through the SSL. It's a bit of the same principle as the uh, SSL signed uh, emails, but in a more sophisticated. Uh, way where you can have uh, different people uh, signing the, uh, the, the transaction or the document. And uh, I think it's, uh, it is an area that really needs to be uh, explored because there are lots and lots, of, uh, lots and lots of applications to it. Okay, thank you. Richard? I think the way that yeah, technology can you know, overlap and integrate in other areas is, is really fascinating. And I, I'm you know, very interested say in Africa at the moment, the way that the mobile phone has become the, basically the, the de facto method of, of banking uh, in many of the countries and the, these wonderful convergence of, of different technologies. Um, in terms of the broader application of, of Bitcoin technology, all I really have to say is I'm a 50-year-old economist. Um, I don't really uh, have a view on that and I'm probably not uh, competent to have a view on that. Anything to add? Um, no, I was just thinking of, uh, in, uh, I live in uh, Hong Kong, and so in Hong Kong, uh, when we sign a document, uh, for when I sign a document for my company, I need to chop it with the company chop. Uh, those company chops, they, they cost like, uh, I don't know, maybe five dollars, and you can make them uh, everywhere in the street. And that's the way uh, the bank or your counterpart is going to uh, authenticate the fact that you were the actual uh, signature of, uh, of the document which is totally retarded and uh, which I think shows uh, 
the, the need and the potential uh, for this kind of uh, verification technologies. Okay, so if, okay, so, so we've come to the end of all the questions. So right now, uh, we want each of you to make a closing statement about your views on Bitcoin and maybe just address each other's uh, arguments. So this time, Richard, you have one minute. So I work for a private bank. You know, most of what we do is we help um, wealthy individuals to manage their, their assets. A large part of that is trying to encourage them uh, not to do dumb stuff and to, to lose their money on crazy speculative pro projects. Uh, so I think you know, our advice from that point of view is if you view this type of thing as an investment, uh, you're crazy, you've got a reasonable amount of, of losing all your money, uh, my target price is zero. Uh, if you're using it as a, as a means of making complex transactions, um, then sure, there does seem to be some, some future in there. I think, I think Aurelian's made a, a, a good, good point that, uh, that it does have some merit. But my concern is that's not the way it's being sold in the papers, that's not the way it's being sold to the public. It's basically being sold, I think, uh, as a Ponzi scheme, and I think a lot of people are buying this stuff in a media-driven frenzy. They don't understand what they're getting or, or maybe what they're not getting. And I think as a result, a lot of people are going to, going to uh, regret it. Thanks. Okay. So, Aurelian, your closing statement? Um, to prepare this uh, debate, I had uh, I researched a bit about the, the articles we had in the press uh, 20 years ago on the Internet. And all the articles were about scams, fraud, uh, dealers, and so on. And it's exactly what we're reading uh, today about Bitcoin. And, um, and why is that? It's just that um, uh, for uh, the, mainstream, uh, the mainstream adoption of a uh, new technology takes a lot of time. And uh, at the beginning, there are only those who really need uh, something different to hide uh, themselves and so on that are going to adopt it. But once we will have uh, those uh, user-friendly solutions, uh, I'm, I'm sure this adoption will, uh, will be effective. And uh, what we've seen in the past is that um, consumers' adoption is getting faster and faster. So I'm really confident that within like three to four years, Bitcoin will be uh, as widespread as uh, uh, Google or Internet are today. Time's up. So, so that's the end of the debate. So please give the, uh, both uh, debaters a hand, please. For Bitcoin, you're going to announce. No, you announce. Everybody give it up for Gwen. All right, Gwen. Thank you very much, Richard. So the Bitcoin debate, again, is the first time we tried out a debate format. Hopefully you enjoyed it. We had about almost 100 votes, so that's good. So the winner for the debate is Richard Jerem, um, Bank of Singapore Chief Economist. Richard, are you here? Round of applause. Thank you. Richard Jerem, are you here? Apparently not. Oh, Andrew, thank you very much. So wait, wait, wait. We need, we need to kind of show off like the t-shirt. Right. So it says, can we focus? Yeah. Price of Bitcoin, $500. Price of winning Bitcoin debate, priceless. <laughs> thank you very much.